All right. Hello and welcome to KubeCon. We're happy to, to be here with you today to talk about Rook and SEP and the deep dive. Uh, I'm Travis Nielsen uh, from Red Hat. I'm one of the maintainers uh, focusing on the SEP operator here with Sebastian. Uh, hi, everyone. Happy to be here as well in this virtual event. Uh, I'm Sebastian Han. Uh, I work with Travis. Um, we're both at Red Hat. Uh, I'm, I'm one of the Rook maintainers as well. And I'm I'm focusing mainly on the Ceph integration, the, the Ceph backend provider. Mm -hmm. Yep. So let's see if we can get this virtual event figured out. And I'm going to turn off our video so we can focus on the slides. So next slide here. All right. So you've heard a bit from Jared and Alexander in the Rook introduction talk a couple of days ago, hopefully. If you didn't have a, a chance to go check that out, I'd definitely recommend it. Um, we, uh, you know, what, what's happening in Rook, just to recap what they might have already said. So the, we, we've been a CNCF incubating, incubating project since September of uh, 2018. Uh, and we're now going through the, the final uh, phases of, of graduation. The voting is in progress as of our recording today. And we're really hoping, fingers crossed, that the voting is all completed and we can announce graduation at KubeCon. Now we hope for your vote there as well. It's just been a great journey and, and looking forward to, uh, to that being done. Um, our latest release is version 1.4. Um, so check it out, try it out. Uh, we'd love your feedback. We always value the feedback of the community to make the product better and better. Um, so again, what is Rook? Uh, so to start off, Rook is an open source project, Apache 2 license. Uh, and it is a, a collection of storage operators for Kubernetes uh, for multiple storage providers, including Ceph and um, Cassandra, and NFS, and a few others. But today we're going to focus on the Ceph operator uh, for this deep dive. So Rook, fundamentally, its job is to automate the management of Ceph. Now, Ceph, as a software-defined storage system, is you know, it, it's complex and it, well, it needs to be deployed, configured uh, when it's time to upgrade. You know, there are tasks that we just want to make sure work smoothly, that work well and do it in a way that works in an absolutely integrated way with Kubernetes. There's no reason for um, doing things outside Kubernetes when you can do it all inside your same Kubernetes cluster. You need storage. Um, come to Rook and Ceph to get that, that storage. So next, uh, what is Ceph? Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have heard of it, but it is also a, so it's a separate open source project, and it is the distributed software-defined solution, storage solution. Uh, it provides block, uh, shared file system, and object storage. Um, so with Think of block storage as what we typically think of as, you know, you need read, write. Once volumes, RWO volumes in Kubernetes, you, you know, that's going to be a block volume typically. A shared file system, uh, you need multiple uh, clients to share the same volume. Uh, RWX typically uh, used for that. And then object storage, if you need an S3 endpoint, Ceph also can provide that layer of the storage. Uh, so that's Ceph in a, in a nutshell. Uh, so what does this look like? We've got a few diagrams here. Uh, well, before we get to the diagrams, actually, let me talk about three layers of the system that are just Im important and helpful to understand the difference. So Rook, the operator, has an operator for Ceph, and it owns the management of Ceph. That means it deploys Ceph. It manages everything about Kubernetes integration with Ceph. Okay, that's the first layer. Second layer um, is CSI. So CSI allows you to uh, dynamically provision and attach your, your client pods or applications to the storage layer. You know, CSI is the, uh, the interface for um, any, any storage volume for uh, in Kubernetes and other uh, platforms. But there's a CF, Ceph CSI driver that then provides that in Rook and to provide the Ceph storage. 
And then finally, the third layer is the data layer with Ceph. I mean, Ceph, as I already mentioned, absolutely provides that, that data connection. Uh, Rook in no way is involved in the data path once all of this is set up and running. Um, and so let's take a look now at these diagrams of what, um, what it looks like from Rook's perspective. So layer one, what does Rook look, look like? Um, let's see if I can point with my mouse here. So the, the Rook operator is, is the, core, uh, the core component in, in the system of managing Ceph. The operator is the brains that decides how to deploy uh, Ceph. You know, it stores or calls all the Kubernetes APIs and works to make sure Ceph is just working uh, seamlessly. So a comment about the color coding here, the blue pods are uh, what we we'll consider as Rook, you know, core Rook pods. Like we've got discovery daemons that are running on nodes to discover what devices are available. And, but most things are not actually core Rook pods. These green pods then are layer two with the CSI plugin, CSI driver for Ceph. And then the red pods are going to be uh, all of the Ceph daemons. So Ceph has a number of different daemons that, that have their responsibilities to provide the storage. And you know, you've got the mons that are the brains for Ceph. You've got the OSDs that actually manage the individual data devices where, where storage is is found on an on an actual node, uh, and anyway, we don't have time to go into all what all these demons are, but just know that so Rook is deploying these pods and services and other Kubernetes resources to manage Ceph and and the CSI driver. Okay, so layer two. Um, in layer two, we've got the CSI driver, so we're at the point now where if layer one is deployed, we're assuming, okay, Ceph is ready to go. It's ready to be consumed. Now let's figure out how to consume it. So you create your app and uh, you define a, a storage class. So here, let's start on the left. We've, so you define a volume claim, a PVC, where you want to claim that storage. Um, that request that from the RBD storage class. So RBD is the Ceph block layer. So you define the storage class and then uh, the Ceph CSI driver for RBD provisions that, that volume and returns it back to the application pod and mounts it in that pod. Okay, and the same basic pattern happens for the shared file system. I mean, you've got um, the PVC that request the storage from the CephFS storage class now. Uh, CephFS is the shared file system. And then uh, the CSI driver for CephFS is the one that provisions the volume and again, mounts it for the application pod. And the third type of storage we've got here is object uh, with the S3 or REST endpoint. And we've got in Rook, a bucket claim, a concept very similar to PVC, but it's for object storage. It gives you a bucket from a special kind of object storage class, which we've defined. And then uh, the bucket provisioner creates the bucket and returns it to the application. Okay, so now that we've deployed Rook in layer one, we've got the CSI driver um, attaching all the storage to your pods in layer two. Now it comes time to actually write data to Ceph, layer three. So when in this, this picture, the um, layer one and two are really out of the picture. We're just talking about your application now needs to write data. So it goes to the volume mount here for RBD. Uh, there's an RBD kernel driver that knows how to go talk to all of these uh, Ceph daemons, which are running here, the mods and OSDs, and it just abstracts all of that for you and, and makes it work. The And same for CephFS and object store, object storage. You, you know, the, the client just talks to the volume or the S3, I use the S3 client like it would any other 
um, targeting S3 or targeting volume. And underneath the covers, CephFS kernel driver handles the connection to Ceph, or the S3 client handles the connection to the RDW endpoint for that object storage. OK. Wow, time is flying. I wish we had even more time to, to dive in here. So what does it take to get started with Rook? Uh, we, we've made it as simple as possible in Kubernetes. And, and you also hopefully saw that demo in the intro talk on, on it actually working. Uh, but there's basically three manifests or YAML files that you need to, to create. So you start off with the one they call common.yaml. That gives you your RBAC settings, uh, gives privileges to the operator, basically. So you create the operator, and then you define how you want Rook to deploy the Ceph cluster in the cluster YAML. On the right here, we've got a snippet that we don't really have time to talk about, but basically we tell we tell this tells Rook how to deploy Ceph in your cluster. Once you've deployed Ceph, then again that layer one, uh, this picture kind of shows the layer two and three where you define the storage class. You create a PVC for your application. And then if your application might define its pod spec, something like this, where the volume has a PVC uh, that refers back to that, that volume that's been cleaned. And from there, it's just like any application that has a local volume and can write and read, read from it. Um, so let's back up a second and say, OK, that seemed too simple. Well, yeah, you probably need to, to plan a little more ahead for how you want to deploy in your production servers. Um, you know, Do you want to deploy in, on bare metal? Do you have your own data center, or are you deploying to the cloud? Um, do you have local devices, or do you have something else? So whether you're in the on bare metal or in the cloud, um, you need you can decide, well, do I want to provision storage that Ceph uses, provision that from a PV? If I'm in the cloud, like maybe I want to, to back Ceph by an EBS or, or you know, a Google volume. Uh, whatever storage provider or cloud provider I'm in, I should be able to consume its storage and put Ceph on top of it. And we'll talk more about that in a minute in that scenario. Or if I'm in my data center and and I just have raw devices, OK, maybe I want to use all raw devices. Maybe I want to list all the nodes and devices individually because I don't trust Rook or don't want Rook to use all devices. Um, or maybe I want a lot more flexibility for these for a new concept called Ceph drive groups. And Rook lets you configure those drive groups in our latest release. And, and again, when you're setting up your cluster topology, um, you're, you got to think about your failure domains. You know where do you, you know if if you have a node or a or a zone whole zone go down, you know how can you keep your your cluster working? You, want, you need to spread the different um, root components and set components across those failure domains because if one failure domain goes down, if it's set up properly, your storage keeps on working and it, it handles that. It's designed for that resiliency. Um, and also, you know, as you're doing that, you know, Rook is as flexible as possible within the means that Kubernetes provides. So you can have node affinity, you, you know, you've, you're tainting your nodes and you can add tolerations to Rook, um, you can pod anti affinity, et cetera. Uh, whatever options for placement that Kubernetes uh, offers, we, we do our best to expose that through Rook. And one more, so back to this topic on cloud environment. So why would you want to run Rook and Ceph in a cloud environment, you, you might ask, because the cloud provider already has storage. Well, there's a few important concepts here. So first, you know, a, having a consistent storage platform wherever Kubernetes is deployed is a powerful concept. Rook gives you that storage abstraction where you can run Rook everywhere Kubernetes runs. Um, store or cloud providers do have shortcomings that we hear about, you know, whether it's having storage across AZs or there's slow failover times, limitations of the number of PVs per node, 
and even perf characteristics of of large. You want the perf characteristics of, of large volumes, not small volumes. So you get that with with Rook. And then finally, you know, you can run Ceph the Ceph components. So the Mons and the OSDs are the the two that are stateful and that store all the state for Ceph. Um, you can run them on PVCs, meaning you don't need direct access to local devices. Um, these these can run request PVCs from the cloud environment. All right, and now I'll hand the torch over to Sebastian to continue on some other key features in Rook. Take it away. Yeah, thanks, Travis. So now that we are um, familiar with what Rook is, what it does, and also what Ceph is and what it can provide to us in terms of functionality, then let's dive into some of the key features that uh, Rook provides to you. All right, so one of the beauty of Rook is that everything is automated. And that's it's it's essentially it is really what the the goal of every single operator is uh, is, is to take all of that operational knowledge and just just put it into a logical entity where it could really benefit of years of experience of managing upgrades and actually upgrades is probably always one of the most painful and difficult thing to to achieve uh, when it comes to software so fortunately rook is here for you and um, rook can handle all of that so there are two things right uh, the first one is uh, upgrading rook on its own and it's super easy you just need to update the the image spec of your deployment and then Kubernetes will go ahead and roll out a new version of, of your operator. Obviously, once we we do a big step to a new version of Rook, uh, for example, we we just released 1.4. So if you go from 1.3 to 1.4, then there are steps that you would have to apply. So to um, using using the the upgrade guide so that. CRD definitions can be updated as well as necessary RBACs to, to have Rook keep, keep on working. And then probably the most interesting piece here is the Ceph upgrade on its own, where Rook will really be handling everything. Um, and again, it is really simple. The only thing you have to do here is just to update uh, the Ceph cluster custom resource and change its image by a new one. Uh, Rook supports pinpoints updates as well as major upgrades of, of Ceph and all of the intricacies and all of the details that um, you have to all the things you would be doing manually per se uh, all of these things would be would be handled by Rook. Uh, Rook will go one by one daemon by daemon and make sure that they're all healthy before moving to the next one uh, as part of its uh, own reconciliation. So yeah, uh, upgrades are, I would say, finally made really simple and really easy to do. Uh, and actually, we just have really good feedback from the community. Uh, it's really super straightforward to upgrade Rook and uh, not painful at all. So moving on now to the CSI driver. Uh, obviously, as Travis mentioned, we can deploy Rook deploys Ceph, maintains it through its entire life cycle, but there is no point of simply deploying a storage technology. Also, what you have to do is to use it so that you can provide persistent storage to your containers. And this is where CSI, and particularly Ceph CSI, plays a big role. Um, as part of the latest version of Rook, we also introduced and released at the same time a 3.0 version of the CSI driver. As we saw earlier, uh, it still supports dynamic provisioning for all the access methods, RW, RWX, and for both block devices as well as file system. But what's really new about this is really the snapshots and cloning functionality uh, that are actually better and ready to be consumed as some kind of a tech preview, let's say. Also, we still have support for flex drivers. So if you're still using it, then uh, upgrade will be supported and you, you can continue on using it. But obviously, this is where the community is moving. The community is moving out of Flex Driver for CSI. So it's, it's really highly uh, recommended to move. Um, but 
to CSI, but still we, we support Flex. All right, um, external cluster connection. That was probably one of the most desired feature uh, two or three releases ago. And essentially what, what we do here is that it is not always about green fields, right? Uh, not everybody has moved to fully Kubernetes environments yet. And maybe some of you will never do. Uh, because you already have a brownfield environment and your self cluster is already there. Maybe it's serving other purposes. Maybe it's connected to OpenStack. Maybe it's connected to your Proxmos hypervisor, whatever it might be. And uh, what this external mode allows you to do is basically um, start this consumer producer relationship where the producer is the external cluster and the consumer at this point is Rook. Uh, so the, the major difference here is that Rook at this point won't be managing the resources. It will only consume them. And the beauty of that is that it is really simple. So the only thing you have to do is to inject a couple of details from your external cluster and, and you're, you're ready to go. CSI would get those information and then you can go ahead and create your PVC, start your pods and uh, you, you got your storage. Object bucket provisioning. So. Uh, AKA OBC, we have already discussed that briefly uh, in one of the diagrams that Travis showed you earlier, but essentially it is really similar to the PVC interface where at this point you don't do block devices, you just do bucket. As a user, you don't wanna really go into the, let's say, well, the pain of having to create a bucket manually, having to create a user manually. The only thing you care about is give me a bucket, give me credentials so then I can start playing with this S3 API uh, and I can connect my application uh, to it. And Rook basically provides you that, that support. All right, um, here it is, the latest and greatest uh, release of Rook. Uh, I'm super excited about all the things that uh, everyone has been doing, uh, all the contributions we received from the, from the community. And uh, here are some, uh, some of the highlights. First off, we, um, Maltus. First, we, uh, we introduced Maltus during the 1.3 cycle. And uh, we, we actually marked it as experimental. The reason why we marked it as experimental is because we, we, have, we had um, half of the picture complete. And what I mean by that is, in 1.3, we were already able to consume Maltus by basically bootstrapping the entire Rook cluster using dedicated network interfaces. Uh, but was, what was not available yet uh, is uh, the connection through CSI. You know, what, we, what we added in that 1.4 release is basically the ability to connect CSI through Maltus so that application pods can consume the storage via a dedicated network. So if we step back a little bit, uh, like in Maltus, why would you need to have Maltus? Um, if, you, if you're using a Bermuda environment and then you really want to take advantage of all the network interfaces that you're, that, that, that basically bought for, for your hardware, um, then this is where Maltus comes into play. We don't really want to use the host networking mode because it has some security implications since we expose the entire network stack from the host into containers. But with Maltus, we can actually we can actually decide which IP uh, which network interface we want to expose into a given container. So we just get best of both worlds. Um, still, uh, we uh, the way Multis is supported is through the whereabouts IPAM. It is really preferred, and that's the the essentially the only one we support right now. It's probably the one that works best at scale because there is no DHCP involved, and and whereabouts does its own uh, IP management internally. So. Um, it is a, a more than a year old and of really active development. Uh, so obviously we don't have the full picture yet and things are missing like uh, supporting services. Uh, we still cannot create services that are backed by 
Multus networks basically. But this is coming, uh, and what we have today is really consumable. So we're super excited about this. Okay, uh, on to the object multi site replication. So this is a feature that has been around in Ceph uh, for its um, object gateways for, for years now. And uh, it's probably one of the most desired feature that the uh, community has been asking for for the past year is the basically the ability to do object through multi-site. Uh, either you have geographically separated data center between regions maybe. Um, and the idea here is to replicate objects uh, between rook Ceph clusters uh, that, are, that are distant distant uh, to, to each other's. Uh, with that, we, we added new concepts and they are coming straight from Ceph, uh, like realms and zone groups and zone, uh, which gives us, they, they really give us a thin granularity on how to configure this uh, geo replication. So it is marked as experimental because we only have the controllers as well as the new custom resources and in 1.5, we will be working to basically get all the pieces together to get a complete uh, a complete experience. Admission controller. You cannot actually uh, validate everything through the API validation from your, YAML, from your YAML definitions. Also, you don't necessarily want to do all of your CR, CR spec validation through the controller, so through the operator. Uh, because essentially, once you do that, it is a little bit too late. Uh, the, C the CR has been injected, um, and now the admin has to go through the logs and see why nothing's happening. Uh, but what's really good about the admission controller is that the admission controller will effectively intercept the creation request of the custom resource even before the operator reconciles and knows about it. So that is really useful because straight from uh, after straight after the injection, you know if something's wrong and badly configured. So yeah, it is. Uh, uh, it was also one of the most desired features. We we have not enabled it yet, uh, but we will do that soon. The toolbox, the toolbox has been around for like since um, since Ruka actually started. Uh, it is a little deployment that allows us to get hands-on access to the Ceph environment. Uh, you just bootstrap it like a normal pod, and uh, once you exec into it, you can run any of the Ceph commands just like you would be, um, like just like you would do normally. Um, and in 1.4, what we added essentially is uh, jobs that would do specific actions, uh, such as day two operations. Uh, again, uh, we don't, the, the main point of Rook is to make storage easy, easily consumable, easily configurable, and easily maintained and self-maintained as well through Rook. So the idea here is to have no manual integration and we have jobs that will do specific actions. For example, if, an, if a disk is, is dead, then we can simply remove it. And for that, we would have a specific job that would care Take care all of that will take care of that. It will just remove the OSD, remove all the keys and all the little details that you would have to do manually. But again, this is fully automated, and more more templates and more jobs will, will be coming uh, uh, as we move forward. We improved our external mode. Um, as mentioned before, this was really one of the best features um, that we delivered in one three, uh, and we have been building on top of what we had. So it's even more stable, even more robust right now. We added the support for uh, gathering external metrics from the external cluster through the Ceph Manager Prometheus Exporter. So if you have an external Ceph cluster and if you have your Kubernetes environment with Rook, then you can connect both and then you can basically have metrics coming from your external cluster in Prometheus and then you can generate, generate alerts and graphs um, so it's basically getting the best out of Prometheus um, onto an external environment, which is which is kind of cool. Uh, also, we extended the external support to the Ceph Object Store 
So now you can actually connect to external gateways and they will be integrated in the exact, exact same fashion as when you do the converged mode. So you just pass the gateway IP addresses and they will be integrated as a Kubernetes service. So that is also a really nice feature. And much more, uh, unfortunately, we don't have much time to discuss into many details all the good things, all the good contributions we received in that uh, wonderful 1-4 cycle. But some of the few uh, last items uh, worth mentioning, encryption for OSD on PVC. So essentially, just um, doing encryption at rest on the, on the drive. Health checks and liveness probe configuration. Um, Rook has some internal health checks, like checking the months are in quorum, checking the status of the cluster, checking the OSD status. And these are now, uh, can be uh, more thinly grained uh, configured, uh, as well as the liveness probe for each individual demons. Uh, also, nonetheless, uh, the, um, all the Rook CRDs have been converted to use the controller runtime library. So we are really moving uh, with the community were by using the same framework, uh, the same primitives um, uh, as the uh, as all the other operators out there. Uh, cluster cleanup was already available in one three, but we added uh, a nice announcement uh, as part of the cleanup for the drives. Now, not only you can clean up the drive, but you can also apply specific and actually uh, more powerful sanitizing functionality for, for your drives. Also, just like Travis mentioned earlier, we the, there is a new Ceph drive group standard to define uh, OSD drives, and this has been uh, embedded into the, the Ceph cluster CR. And I guess with that, this really concludes our presentation. Uh, it was a really interesting experience uh, at first, I guess. So hopefully you will enjoy uh, that. Uh, don't forget to reach out to us. Uh, go on rook.io. You will see all the materials, all the doc, how to get started, where to find us. Go on GitHub as well. And uh, we'll be really happy to uh, to hear from you. Yeah, thanks, Sebastian. It's been great to be with you today. And we definitely look forward to all your questions or contributions. Come find us on Slack and, and GitHub and all that. And hopefully we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thanks. Stay safe. Take care. Bye-bye.